So, and I, the, the, the bill of fare that's dished up for this festival is absolutely wonderful. It's a great mixture of immensely experienced and wonderfully established and talented writers, mixed in with some, some amazingly talented women, particularly, that are coming up to the ranks and have a huge journey ahead of them in the writing stakes. It's, it's just a wonderful festival, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of it. And it, it's, I suppose, I, I remember reading, actually, I, Brian Keane was here, and I remember reading his, his amazing book, An Evil Craving, and just being overwhelmed by the language of it, it was, it spoke to me of somebody who had come out of a dark place and was discovering words like colours, and it was just one of those, as, as a writer myself of, you know, newspaper articles, I remember reading it and just being utterly overwhelmed and moved by the book. So it's a wonderful pleasure to be, to have him at, in, at this festival in, in the same room as him. And of course, you know, tomorrow night we're looking forward immensely to hearing him talk to Robert Fisk, who is, of course, a legend. And as a newspaper journalist, someone of his caliber, I have just immense, immense, just absolute and utter awe for, for the man. He has been to every war, he has covered every conflict, and he's, you know, as an Arabic speaker, he's, he's interviewed Osama bin Laden three times. And I suppose really to put in context the massive gulf between someone like him and someone like me was after 9-11, I, I was in this, living in the States at the time, and I interviewed a guy who owned a cafe called Osama's Place, which is probably the nearest, you know, I would have gone to that. No, I did get a little fame out. It was the local paper in Fayetteville did actually put me on the front page saying, European media comes to Fayetteville. So, you know, it was a good moment for me. And it's also wonderful as I suppose as a woman writer to, to give a huge shout out to people like Neil Boyce and, and Louise and Neil who are here. And really? it's and I think the important thing is certainly in recent years there's been a tendency to put women in the category of you know women writers a chicklet and you know they write about sewing and shopping and you know while all that is absolutely valid and fine it's wonderful to see books that are genuine literature that deal with with the, the, the deep and powerful things of life and it's not just a, a woman writing, it's a brilliant writer writing and I think that's the important thing as well and uh, I'm blown away by their use of language and their confidence at so, at, in such young ages as well. I mean, when I was that age, I, you know, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't even imagine. I mean, I'd write a diary and that was about the height of it and bury it. I couldn't imagine writing anything so powerful and so truthful. And then I had, just had a great chat with Oshin uh, now, and you know we're, he's he's so enthusiastic, and I love what he's enthusiasm about introducing the younger generation to the worlds of words and books, and how important it is, and how to nurture that sort of their love of language, and you know he encourages them to talk about the cool words and so on, and you know to just to get children used to, and to the younger people used to the use of language. It's so important. You know, you sort of see them sitting on screens every time I see my own nieces and nephews, you know, your heart sinks and you think, you know, here, just read a book. It's no no, you can't just flick it to turn a page, you actually have to physically turn the page, you know. And it's I just think it's it, it's everybody should just take a leaf out of literally out of Ushin's book, you know, see a kid, read this, learn to love language, you know, it's so important. I mean I feel a bit of a fraud standing up here in one level because you know, I'm a journalist more than a writer and um, I was sort of struggling to think, you know, are they the same thing? And one level they are because I suppose we're both members of the awkward squad. You know, we ask hard questions and, you know, we don't take just the trite for an answer and we always try to find the truth in something. And I suppose at the end of the day, you know, we do tell stories in our own way. Um, I'm joined here tonight by a, like a, a great, my best friend and former colleague, Claire Grady, and she might actually understand this story. Uh, many, many years ago, when I was just starting out in journalism, um, I was working in the Evening Herald, and it was a brutal shift. You had to be in very early in the morning, maybe 6.30, and it was one dark November morning, and I'm running in the door, because the first in got the easy gig. You got just to ring all the cop shops and make calls and stay in nice and dry. And I was beaten in the door by a colleague of mine, uh, Brendan Farley, who made it in the door, took off his coat, 
sat down with a smile and the news editor, Martin Brennan, down the end of the, of, the de of the room, saw the two of us and he went to me, don't take off your coat. Now this is always a presage of disaster. So I'm looking out at the beating rain and I walk up to him and he says, hands me a, a docket for a taxi and he said, uh, go out to Darndale. There was a big fight out in a camp there last night and there was sort of machetes and blood everywhere and, and you know, go out there and see what that's about. So Brendan is laughing with his ass off across the room and I'm trekking out and he goes to Brendan and you don't take off your coat. <laughs> So Brendan's going, ah, come on, Martin, give me a break. And he goes, no, no, there was a fire in a prefab uh, in a school just off the road, so go up there and see what that's about. So Brendan was going, oh, brilliant, did anybody die? No, 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 nobody died. So what's wrong? Well, the school, there was a prefab burned down. So Brendan's going, ah, come on, give me a break. So he says, out you go. So perfect timing, just as Brendan got to the door, he said, Brendan, don't come back until you find me a hero. <laughs> so, in fairness to Brendan, he did, and I think, you know, at the moment of that, what we do in journalism and what we do in writing, there's always that sort of search for, you know, the hero, the meaning, the redemption, the, the thing that will grasp somebody's interest or will appeal to their heart. So, you know, maybe I was trying to console myself, you know, I don't feel such a fraud standing up here in the light, of, you know, with so much talent. And um, I was just going to read out something. I mean, I was, so, I was thinking about this before I came here, and you know, maybe the dilemma for a journalist as opposed to a writer is that you have to deal with facts. Um, and sometimes you have to mistrust the facts. That's the trouble, and even though it's a currency of our trade, you know, facts can be used to bully us, to confuse us, to betray us. You know, they can be scaffolds of the untrue. Um, you know, all one something you have to do is look at the nature of facts that have been fed to us in, in different, you know, it, the facts that they use in political climates to, you know, to topple the Twin Towers, you know, to, or to settle Palestinian hillsides or, you know, to put hoods on a man in Guantanamo Bay. You know, facts are, facts can be tricky. They can be tricky things and they can be untruthful things. And quite often facts are, they're more invented by you know, needy corporate public relations trying to sell you something. And it's your job as a writer in any sphere to pick your way through that and, and try and get over the manipulation of facts. So I was pondering over this quite recently and I emailed a great friend of mine, Colin McCann, who I hopefully you've heard of and know, and you know, and I said to him, Colin, you're wise, you know, tell me things I don't know, tell me about, give me the secret of writing, you know as a shortcut so that I can just sit down and write a brilliant novel in five minutes like you can and move to Westport or something nice. So he emailed me this, I, he, he just of course he just emailed this, he said, uh, we must write to call the world into silence, if even just for a moment. We must write to continue the dialogue beyond the five minute soundbite. We write to value our experience, horrific and beautiful both. We write because all the stories need to be told over and over and over again. We write in order to speak to and with our pasts. We write because good writing has a valid violence. We write when the bastards have turned our wine into water and we want to write it back into wine. <laughs> we write to find the tenderness in the everyday. We write for the fierce pleasure we take in doing it. We write to create a place that never existed before. We write to defeat logic. We write because mystery joins us together. We write to question the facts. We write to question how they have stolen the facts. And we write to inhabit the very, con very contradictions, con contradictions of these facts. This, more than anything, he said, is a reason for me to write, so that I can know what it is like to live inside, outside, and beyond a fact. This, to me, is the beauty of good writing, and, of course, of good reading. We enter a world, a new world, one that we never thought of we could embrace and it becomes real for us. We mediate it. We enter the burnt out building or the street after the light rain or the shirt sleeve flapping at the window and we are immediately beyond the normalcy of fact. Instead, we smell the deep intricacies of the human spirit. We can be repulsed or invigorated. Both are equally valid, even if they are at odds with each other. A writer with an idea or an agenda has already become a politician. Beware the writer who knows exactly what he or she wants to do. There will be no mystery there. So, yeah, I could have been all year and I'd never come up with a sentence like that. So he kind of made my job easy for me.
So, so just to finish up, um, I just want to tell you how much I love Westport. I've, I've had some great times here, I've some wonderful times. One of the best was actually at Claire Grady's wedding a few years ago. Um, and also, there was one great occasion around more recently where I'd, I actually had a chance to alight to a politician, which was, gave me a great thrill, <laughs> usually is the way around. And I was dispatched by my office down to, um, to cover Enda Kenny, who was doing something in Westport. It's fine. So when I get here, I realise what he's actually doing is he's climbing Croke Patrick. <laughs> and unfortunately, as the colour writer where the tea shop goes, so too must I. <laughs> So I had never climbed the week, beautiful week before, so up and I'd had a, I'd dined well in Baton the night before, so I was feeling a little fragile. So up I went, and I was sweating buckets and seeing double and re absolutely just rethinking my whole relationship with the, the Almighty. So I, get, I finally crawled to the top and I lie down on the ground. <laughs> And next thing I see the shadow of me, and there's Enda Kenny, bright as a button, not a bother on him, poking me with a stick. Are you all right there, Are you all right there, Lise? Ah, yeah, please shock you on. I'm grand. <laughs> so, I just concluded this one story, which might actually be Brian, um, and maybe it may make you think that us we journalists aren't actually so bad as we're painted. Many years ago, 1991, and myself and a co-conspirator journalist, who shall remain namely, were down here. We had been out in Clare Island for the weekend, having a ball with the Saw Doctors. So think about it, Clare Island Saw Doctors, journalists, not good. So the next morning, we're sitting back in a little cafe, um, waiting for the train. We're both not particularly well. And we're both, you know, hungry journalists trying to make our way in the world. We're sitting looking out the window, and we see this couple going by. And I looked at them, and I immediately recognised the man. And my friend, she immediately recognised the woman. And it was John McCarthy and Jill Morrell. Now, at this stage, the world media were looking for them. They were not, it was not long after they were reunited, after uh, John McCarthy was released. And we both looked at them, and there they were, and they did a couple of bags of shopping, and they're walking down the street. And they looked so happy and so content. And the two of us rose because this was a genuine world exclusive. This was it. This was going to make us. And we stood up and we went, ah, sure, we leave them be. And we sat down. Now, I have never told that story before because I would have thought my ass fired. So I'm sharing that with you tonight, just hoping you think, you know, we're not all bad, really. So that's all I'm going to say. Enjoy the rest of you. Thank you.